and welcome to the Research Impact Summit. I'm your host, Tanika Hyden. In this session, I'll be talking to Mark Reed. Mark is the Professor of Rural Entrepreneurship and Director of the Thriving Natural Challenge Centre at Scotland's Rural College and a visiting professor at Newcastle University, Birmingham City University and the University of Leeds. He has over 150 publications that have been cited in more than been cited more than 20,000 times and has won awards for the non-academic um, impact of his research. He's author of the Research Impact Handbook, which was used to train over 8,000 researchers from more than 200 institutions in 55 countries. He provides training and advice to universities, research fund funders, NGOs, and policymakers internationally. Mark, thank you for joining me and welcome back to the Research Impact Summit. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure, Tamika. Thank you. <laughs> so, Mark, I'm really excited to talk to you about a case study. Um, you've offered to share an example with us, and I believe your team's research on the restoration of damaged peatlands contributed to the design and implementation of the UK's first ever ecosystem market for peatland restoration, uh, the Peatland Code, and generated over £300 million of public and private investment in restoration to meet climate targets, which is huge. Um, and I also believe there's many other impacts that have come from this work. So I'll let you tell us about the work that you did, and I'd love to learn about the strategies that you've employed to get to impact. Very good. So, so first of all, I need to uh, credit my team. Um, uh, and uh, it's not even my team, there's, there are teams of people who have worked on this over the years. Um, we started this journey uh, when I was at the University of Leeds 15 years ago, um, so many of my colleagues from there. Um, uh, since then, at Birmingham City in Newcastle, as you said, I'm still a visiting professor there. Um, uh, the IUCN UK Peatland Programme, uh, who owns the Peatland Code, this mechanism you've talked about, um, and a huge community of peatland researchers who have built the evidence base that suggests that when you restore a damaged peat bog, that actually there is a climate benefit from this. So the context is that uh, a, little, a, little, a little known fact is that uh, peatlands globally account for 5% of all our greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and in terms of the global peatland budget, when you put that next to you know, aviation and all the other kind of things that you instantly think of when you think of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, that's a significant amount of greenhouse gases. Um, and if you can fix that problem, not only do you have benefits for the climate, but you're fixing these ecosystems for the unique, often rare plants and animals that live there. Uh, often you're enabling these now to operate in ways which can provide sustainable livelihoods for people and there are benefits in terms of water quality and in some cases flood risk, flood risk alleviation as well. So it's one of these kind of super climate solutions that has all of these multiple benefits in it. Uh, so the next question most people ask is, well, OK, but how are they damaged? And it really varies around the world. So in tropical peatlands, fire is the biggest uh, issue. Um, uh, and when uh, you burn uh, a forest on a peat bog, uh, the problem is a dried out uh, peat bog uh, will go on fire. And now you've got fire burning in the soil, which is very, very difficult to put out, creates huge amounts of pollution. Uh, that's transboundary pollution. Uh, and some of these uh, burning events uh, have been responsible for tens of millions of, of deaths. Uh, but uh, in the UK and other places, this could be drainage. Uh, a lot of uh, us have uh, tried to drain peat bogs uh, to make them productive, um, whether that's for arable or for, um, uh, for pastoral agriculture. Um, uh, we've overgrazed them, etc. So we've got uh, these peat bogs that are in a bad condition and we need to fix them. Uh, and the key thing about a peat bog is it's a peat bog because it's wet. Uh, these are waterlogged systems. And so one of the first things that you need to do is you need to restore the hydrology. So get that water table back up, turn it back into a bog when it's a bog. Uh, then it's uh, going to stop oxidizing and putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, and you're, you're going to actually get a healthy building peat bog. Uh, but to do that, uh, to uh, block these drainage ditches, um, to, to revegetate the bare and eroding peat, etc., that costs a lot of money. And very often these are in really inaccessible places. So great, sounds like a fantastic solution, but how the hell do you actually pay for this stuff? 
Now, governments around the world are uh, clicking on to the fact that this is part of their greenhouse gas budgets. So they're going to have to fix this if they want to meet uh, their um, Paris Agreement targets. But your average government, especially in the in the developing world, doesn't have the funding to make this happen. Uh, and so the, the idea that occurred to me and my colleagues was, well, what if you could actually get the private sector to invest in this? Now, you've got a bunch of companies who are trying to reduce emissions. They've done everything they they can to reduce emissions at source, which is an important point. Uh, and now they want to go that extra step and start offsetting some of that. Well, if we could get that funding combined with whatever government funding there might be into the system, might we be able to actually tackle this with the, the, the scale and the speed that is actually needed if we're going to prevent runaway climate change? Mm, and, and so it sounds like a massive undertaking and obviously it was um can you tell us then about the um the people that you've worked with to to kind of get to where you've gotten from this and to get that impact so um you've made these connections you've obviously been co-producing so who exactly did you involve obviously um you, you mentioned um not necessarily just government but there would have been some government involvement as well so can you tell us more about the the groups that were involved yeah, so there are three different groups primarily that, that I've worked with. So um, you mentioned the uh, the three hundred million pounds worth um, of. Uh, primarily government, but a mixture of government and private investment. Uh, that's a UK investment that has come out of this research um, and uh, this mechanism that we built to then combine private and public um, funding for restoration, the Peatland Code. So there's a UK community that has, has built that work. Uh, then uh, we worked with um, a community of people to develop something called landscape enterprise networks that can then take uh, some of this stuff from peatlands into other kinds of land use systems. So uh, dairy, arable, woodlands, et cetera, integrating all of these different ecosystem markets in a place-based approach. And uh, we've got those now um, in Italy and in Hungary, and we're exploring the potential for that in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, and that's uh, so far led to £5 million worth of uh, additional private investment, uh, but beyond peatlands. And then finally, I've worked with United Nations, uh, UNEP, uh, United Nations Environment Programme, Global Peatlands Initiative, uh, to take some of these lessons uh, more internationally. Uh, so, as I said, a lot of governments around the world realising they need to do this. Um, but in the developing world in particular, uh, the, these private mechanisms are really unlocking the ability to actually make progress here. And as a result of this, um, uh, our research suggests that um, uh, through all of that work, uh, we've got uh, international resolutions and uh, new peatland policies uh, in 29 countries around the world that account for the majority of peatland emissions. So three quite different groups that I've worked with. Um, Probably too 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 long to explain all of this now, but I think that the key thing uh, it, to, to 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 point out. Uh, is that there was a, a real need for certainty in the early days. So right at the beginning, this was actually far more about the science. Uh, I was talking to people in policy and in business, but there were too many uncertainties around the science that people were pushing back. And uh, I'm not sure about this, and this might go wrong. And uh, I was just a bit too yeah, young, naive, keen. <laughs> Uh, I was I was going too fast. Uh, and so uh, I kind of pulled back from that and said, right, uh, we need more science. How can we make that happen? <clears throat> There was loads of science happening, but the way science works, you know, you've got all these different scientific factions, and I, I disagree with those guys. Those guys' model is wrong. My, my model's right. Uh, and what was happening was there was just this noise. Uh, and what the policy and the business community saw was the scientific community don't know. Uh, they can't agree. There isn't any evidence for this. The reality was there was evidence. It was just a bit confusing. And so working with the IUCN UK, UK Peatland Program, I'm their research Please, uh, we convened a series of annual events that brought the policy, practice and research community together to try and work out where actually is there scientific consensus and where do we still disagree and do we need more research. And once we managed to work out, okay, this is where the scientific consensus is, then we were able to go back to government and to our other stakeholders and say, right, we're working on this other stuff, 
But uh, this is where we know that there is scientific consensus. Can we start building these mechanisms already? Uh, and gradually more of that consensus has built, more of those uncertainties have been plugged as, as, as more evidence has come online. Uh, but because we started early, then we were ready to then build those processes, uh, government mechanisms, uh, the people and code, et cetera, uh, and upscale them once there was a strong enough evidence base and, and we already got all the engagement that, that we needed. So I'm going to describe this as a, as a boundary organization. IUCN UK Peatland program effectively was this organization that was able to convene uh, all these different warring scientific factions with the policy community at high enough levels and the practitioner and business community to get that consensus uh, and to start convening people around where we need to prioritize effort in terms of where there is uh, where there is uncertainty. Uh, and to this day, uh, the IUCN UK Peatland Programme continues to play a pivotal role across each part of the UK in bringing people together and keeping pushing this agenda forward. And at the moment, our work is on how to upscale the operation of this mechanism. Uh, in the same way, uh, the Landscape Enterprise Networks, it was a, a, a consultancy called Three Keel, um, and then uh, others uh, like me bringing our networks in to try and uh, connect this through to again government policy so that uh, this is now connecting to what government's doing post brexit in each part of the uk but through to uh, into into business networks uh, and one of the early adopters of this was nestle who uh, gave us access to a whole lot of corporates um, but again uh, that convening power of you know, one person tom tom uh, tom curtis from three keel and a bunch of key networked individuals who were able to say, here's an idea. There's lots, lots of other ideas, probably just as good, but here's an idea uh, and a bunch of people we can connect to this to try and make some progress. And then finally with the UN group, um, the Global Peatlands Initiative, this is Diana Kapansky uh, in charge of this, is that same convening group, a boundary organization that can unite researchers from around the world. Uh, I'm co-chairing a research working group with Diana, uh, along with the, the, the UN, uh, aid, funding agencies, uh, governments around the world. Uh, and yeah, now we can make stuff happen. But you need those, those individuals and those organizations with that convening power to sit uh, between the boundaries of all these different organizations who otherwise wouldn't work together to really make progress. Yeah, that convening organization is a really interesting one and having that sort of central, I guess, intermediary might be another language um, that kind of comes in yeah. a bit as well. Um, and so can you just, uh, you might have mentioned this earlier, it's, it's leaving my brain right now, but can you give us some idea of what's been the timeline between kind of the start of this um, and bringing those people together and then really starting to see those impacts come out of that? Yeah, so um, for, for me, this uh, everyone you speak to who's been engaged will have their own timeline. Um, so this, this is my timeline, but uh, for me, this started in my PhD. I was doing work in the Kalahari Desert. I wanted to have a family. I didn't want to uh, be an absentee father. Uh, and so I had a look around and figured there's lots of peat bogs in the UK. Why don't I swap deserts for peat bogs and, uh, and try to get some funding? Um, I I'd, was connected with some colleagues locally in my university who were interested in peat bogs um, uh, just, just because of those friendly relationships. I figured, hey, here's an opportunity. Uh, I got to, to write a part of a paper with someone um, and that paper got coverage in the Guardian newspaper. That newspaper article got a call from uh, an NGO uh, to say, huh, interesting idea, this whole idea of peatland carbon finance, can you make it happen? At which point I said, huh, it was just an idea. I've got no idea how on earth you would do that. Uh, uh, and so the journey started, um, and that was in 2005. Um, and so it took um, until 2000, and I think it was yeah, 2015, so a full 10 years from idea to the launch of the Peatland Code. Uh, and the first five years of that was all around the evidence. Second five years of that was building a code, piloting a code, you know, testing things out, learning from our mistakes, et cetera. And since 2015, it's been about actually getting that ramped up, uh, influencing, integrating with public funding, uh, and then moving into these other ecosystems and globally 
to the point we are today where we've got um, national impact in the UK and international impact uh, more broadly. But it's been a long journey. And when I look at that original project, um, uh, all of my peatland colleagues I started with on that journey um, are still doing peatland research and impact in their own domains. Um, but I'm the one person who has stuck tenaciously to this idea that this whole peatland finance thing um, and climate change it's got to work somehow <laughs> and let's just keep going until it works or not as the case may be but uh, but i'm sticking with this and uh, and i think yeah, ultimately it's, it's been about that tenacity and and of course as an academic i had the privilege of having a 10-year job that gives me the the freedom to do that and um and i know that many of my early, early career researchers that i work with might want to do that but it's a lot harder when you don't have a permanent position Mm. And so a couple of things that you've said that have been um, really interesting. Thank you for, for that timeline. I think a lot of people would, you know, kind of be going, yeah, okay, I get that. There'll be a lot of uh, early career researchers going, oh, God, it's going to take me that long. <laughs> um, but we know that it does take a long time. I think one of the other things that you sort of mentioned that was really interesting was around that um, the certainty of the science and the confusion that was coming from the different views and getting everyone in the academic realm, I guess, to at least come together and have some sort of consensus around what's ready now and then what needs to be done. And I think that's an incredibly uh, powerful thing to do. And, and so I guess, um, you know, I'd say to some of the people uh, watching, you know, if, if your stakeholders or the people that you're talking to externally are not necessarily coming on board, maybe delve into it. Maybe it is because they're getting mixed messages from other groups that you're not aware of um, that could be, be one of those reasons. In terms of uh, so bringing everyone together, getting that sort of consensus piece going and starting to, to move along the way, um, once you knew some of the work that was ready and you had strong evidence for, um, what happened there around perhaps some of those expectations from the different people involved in those timelines? Because we know, obviously, policymakers, they want everything yesterday. Uh, and then you'll have industry who probably wants it yesterday as well. Um, can you talk to us through about some of that and expectation management? Was there much of that sort of uh, work that was involved from your side? Yeah, yeah. Um, history is repeating itself as, uh, as we speak, in fact. Uh, before I ask you a question, just to, to follow up on, on that previous point you were drawing together on evidence, um, I think doing if I were to do this all over again, I would actually do two things. So um, I think what I would also do is do a bunch of rapid evidence syntheses. Um, so, so yeah, doing a systematic review is a major endeavour. It could take you a year of your life, uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars, um, but uh, but there is now a whole load of, of techniques out there that can enable you to do rapid evidence synthesis. So just Google that, you'll find guides, etc. Um, and uh, and you have to do a few of them on an issue as multifaceted as this. But that's a really robust way of working out actually um, what is the level of consensus on any of these given issues. And we'll just go through each of these different outcomes we might be looking for, different ent interventions we might be interested in funding, for example, one by one, and look at that evidence do some meta-analysis and stats and that's a really robust way of working out what that what the, what the consensus is i think you still need then to bring the community together uh, and and that's now the academic community with the policy and practice community to then reach a, a level where yeah we now know what the consensus is what we can and can't do and this is how we move forward so uh, both of those parts are needed um, a real live example for this, uh, of this at the moment is that um, I'm uh, on a team that is developing a UK farm soil carbon code. Um, uh, and what's interesting about this is uh, my, my team uh, were already asked um, by uh, colleagues from policy and practice uh, from, from the business community. We were, we were told, we want you, uh, we are your stakeholders and we're telling you, we want you in this project to develop a UK farm soil carbon code. So I took it to my colleagues and my colleagues are like, there's no way we can do this. The, the evidence is simply not robust enough. Um, it, it's just we're, we're a decade away um, from being able to do anything like this. And so I went back to our stakeholders and I said, look, I'm really sorry. We don't think this is the right time. Uh, there's, there's just too much more research needed on this. Um, and uh, fast forward two years, and now a bunch of um, outfits have set up to do this with or without a code. Uh, if you've got a bunch of uh, corporates who want to buy soil carbon, you've got enough farmers who are willing to sell that, you've got a market. 
Mm. Um, and so what we now have is the potential for a cowboy market where you've got farmers exposed to unnecessary risks, uh, corporates who backtrack, claw back, um, and now they're asking for refunds and I'm going bust. You've got corporates who potentially are getting double sold stuff. Um, who knows? Uh, and this stuff is happening. Uh, and so I went back to my colleagues and said, so, um, uh, yeah, you don't feel this is ready. It's happening, whether you like it or not. And so uh, what about we actually uh, revisit our stakeholders and try and pull together enough evidence to create some kind of code that can bring um, some coherence um, and some, some safety and guarantees into this market that will keep people safe. <laughs> Um, and uh, and they were still just as reluctant, but uh, there was a sense of urgency and yeah, you know what, we've got to somehow try and do this. Uh, and as a consortium, and we've got all these people who are like, yeah, yeah, so Mark, why can't we just write this damn thing and launch it this year? Uh, we've got all the evidence we need, we need to make this happen. And me and my soil science car colleagues saying, yeah, can we just finish these, uh, these rap rapid evidence syntheses and really be 100% sure that these interventions do deliver the amount of carbon you expect? Because just because it works on one farm or in one study doesn't mean it will work everywhere. And we could have a big problem on our hands if we allow this to go forward without enough evidence. Um, and it is just a constant and growing tension in this community of everyone saying, well, it's happening anyway, so it must work. Um, uh, and, uh, and the scientists saying, it shouldn't be happening, and we need to stop it. And people like me saying, huh, there needs to be that middle ground. We need to try and keep bringing everyone together. And so what I'm trying to do is say, look, everyone come together. Let's not compete with each other. It will create a code. If you're interested in the stuff, get in touch, become part of this extended consortium, and we'll try and together work out what on earth we can do with whatever evidence we can marshal to try and do something in this space. But we're rushing this way faster than the majority of the, of the, the scientific community feel comfortable. The key thing is that we've got that scientific community on board, keeping those breaks on as far as possible and getting that, 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 that balance. Who knows how this will work out? Um, uh, my critics say we shouldn't be doing this. Um, and if we do, we're still at least five years off. Um, and on the other side, my critics saying, uh, how on earth does it take this long? This it should have already been out already. What on earth are you doing? Why are you delaying? Um, so I'm not getting a lot, a lot of love in this space, but I think this is what is needed, is that one a group uh, to create that boundary organization that brings all of that dispute into one place so we can bring some coherence to it and eventually at the end of it speak with one voice about what might actually be possible. Yeah, great advice and, and a really interesting um, story there about that experience. And um, I think, you know, it really does speak to a, a few things. I mean, um, you never want to sort of mention to a to a scientist about lowering their standards, um, but essentially mm. I guess that's what they're thinking when you're sort of saying we need to do this. So I think, uh, yeah, that tension around the, the timelines and it's interesting um, just to kind of hear that from that perspective and not always easy to overcome, but it sounds like uh, that, that there is some common ground, which is great. And that kind of leads me into the next thing I, I really want to ask about as well. And that was um, if you have any advice or insights about the engagement processes and, and what engagement processes you've used and the lessons of those engagement processes that you've learned along the way. Yeah, so I spoke about this, I think, in the last year's summit, so I won't go into it in any more depth. But for me, it's about being systematic um, and therefore I'm doing a stakeholder analysis. So it's not just that I speak to whoever shouts loudest. Uh, I'm being systematic and I'm working out, yeah, there's a big voice here with a huge amount of power that could become that convening body that could make everything happen, uh, that could take me international or whatever it is. Uh, and they may or may not be shouting loudly and knocking on my door. And as a result of having done a stakeholder analysis, I can see I need to work out how I can reach them. Uh, and so uh, I'm working out, right, uh, what are their interests? What are they trying to achieve? What are their objectives? How might I be able to help? Uh, who is the person with all the power in this organization? How can I reach out to them? How much can I find out about them before I reach out to them? So when I reach out, I've got an offer that they can't refuse. I'm trying to get that one-to-one -one connection with them. And once I've made that connection, I'm trying to add as much value as I can to them and to keep that relationship live so that I'm helping them 
achieve what they want to achieve. And at the same time, it's a win-win to whatever I'm trying to, to achieve. But because of systematic, my stakeholder analysis will also identify the marginalized, the voiceless, the poor, uh, those hard to reach groups that everyone forgets about. And oops, it looks like I forgot as well. So let's go. And there's a moral argument now for bringing those groups in um, and to uh, really thinking about that. And again, uh, doing that homework and working out, well, why are they so marginalized? What are the issues I need to make sure that I'm aware of? What is my positionality going to be like as a white male professor uh, coming into a group like this? And how do I manage those kinds of, uh, those kinds of issues? But uh, to bring it all down to, to one thing, it's about relationships. Uh, it's about trust. And I take a systematic approach to be very targeted in that because I don't have time to build and maintain relationships with everyone. Uh, but I've got a hit list now of four or five, five or six organizations um, uh, or groups and people who can represent those groups that I'm now going to invest in and make sure that I keep them live. I'm constantly working for free, uh, picking up the phone, uh, making myself available. Um, and, and I can do that for that number of organizations, that number of people. I can't do it for everyone. Uh, but if I've chosen them effectively based on my stakeholder analysis, then that will look in huge numbers of doors for me. Yeah, fantastic advice. Thank you for that. I think um, that targeted um, piece is, is important and absolutely relationships and trust. It's It's been a really common thread coming through the whole mm. summit has been the, the relationships and trust piece. Um, and I think when, when we talk about impact, if we're not talking using the word relationship or trust, um, yeah, you know, we're not talking about impact really because it's one of those things that's a, a necessity. Um, so I'd just like to finish up by asking you the, you know, the big question. Um, are there things, I guess, um, that you've learned out of this experience um, that you would do differently? I know you mentioned one before, but are there things um, that you might do differently and, and what are they? What are they? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good, a good question. I think um, <sighs> I don't know. There, there are so many things to choose from here. Um, I think that uh, when I look back now um, at how I approach this to start with um, and how I approach these things now, um, I, I was very reactive to start with. Um, so I reacted to uh, this one NGO calling me up because they'd read an article in the newspaper. Um, as a result of that, we had one very small project in the one small part of the UK that that charity happened to, uh, to, to work in. Um, uh, and I knocked on a few doors in government departments um, uh, and I got a few answers, um, but where I didn't get answers, I didn't really pursue that um, particularly strongly. Um, and I think that it's easier now as a, as a professor, uh, just being well known in your field uh, opens doors. Um, but uh, but it is that tenacity of just constantly offering help. And, and I've been surprised as I've moved into new areas. Um, so working in tropical peatlands, for example, I've been very open to people. I know nothing about tropical peatlands. Uh, I've, not, I've never visited a tropical peatland before. I'm not an expert. Um, I'm here to help and do whatever I can to then convene others uh, and, uh, and yeah, do whatever I can do. But, but I'm not that expert. Uh, just constantly going and knocking on doors strategically and making myself useful, answering questions via colleagues when I can't get those answers myself. Uh, I think that that tenacity is something that I've learned over the years and I was much quicker to give up um, in the early days when I didn't get answers to emails, when people kind of went silent on me. And now I'm much more likely to just keep pushing and eventually the person comes back, oh, I'm really sorry, your email came when I was on holiday and oh, we've been going through this reorganization and yes i'm still here and yes of course i, I still want this to happen um, and let's then make this happen um, and so that tenacity and i think at this point in my career now it's about having teams of people and so building in 
funding for project managers who can actually manage the impact for me. Um, and that then is what enables me to be tenacious, despite the fact that I don't have as much time as, uh, as I used to. So whether it's directly or via funding a team of people that can then tenaciously pursue impacts with busy people uh, through all of the obstacles and delays and changes in policy and where everything else that you will uh, you will come across. Yeah, you just need to find that, that willpower uh, and a few mechanisms and, and, and ways of helping yourself out that, that will enable you to just to keep pushing through those boundaries to make something actually happen in the end. Yeah, great advice. And I think, uh, yeah. you know, if I really had to sum it up, I think there's three, I mean, there's lots of things that you've told us that are really powerful, but I think really it's about relationships, being strategic and being tenacious. I love that. So um, yeah, chase it. Um, so Mark, thank you so much for your time and for sharing this, uh, this experience with us. I'm sure people have learned a lot of things and we'll be reaching out to you. I'm sure everyone knows where to find you across social and all those things. And if not, they will find you. And we've put links to that as we've gone through, but it's been an absolute pleasure to have you as part of this year's summit again. So thank you.